Hi everybody, I'm Ashwin. And I'm Raj. And this is Blood Cancer Talks. This is a podcast exclusively dedicated to hematologic malignancies, where we bring content experts who live and breathe a particular disease and focus on the latest advances in biology and clinical management. Today, we are excited to talk about management of polycythemia vera. We have an expert, Dr. Aaron Gertz, an associate professor of medicine and deputy director for clinical research at the Cleveland Clinic Tosic Cancer Institute. He is also the editor-in-chief of ASH Clinical News and the chair of NCCN MPN Guidelines Panel. Dr. Gertz, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for your time. Before we start, can you tell us about yourself, your clinical and research focus for our listeners? Well, thank you so much, Raj and Ashwin. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you today and to talk to all your listeners about polycythemia vera. Uh, you know, in terms of what I do every day, it's a, it's a kind of a mishmash of stuff. Uh, I, I have a fairly large clinic, uh, primarily focused on MPN patients. There's the errant AML and MDS patient that trickles in every now and then, but largely MPNs. And that's fantastic because it marries very well with my clinical research interests, which is you know, developing new, new therapeutics for, for patients with MPNs. I, I manage a, a relatively large clinical trial portfolio where we're, we're testing these new agents and you know, getting samples and collaborating with our translational partners. I also wear an administrative hat, as you mentioned. So I, I, out of my interest in clinical research, I've become more interested in clinical research infrastructure and so help uh, our cancer center uh, allocate resources and, and improve efficiencies in doing clinical research, basically trying to help others do more clinical research, uh, which has been a, a fantastic endeavor, both uh, at TOSIC, uh, at the Cleveland Clinic, as well as our comprehensive cancer center, which we share with university hospitals in Case Western Reserve University. Fantastic, Dr. Gertz. So with that, let's jump right in. We'll start with the case and you can walk us through how you would approach this patient yeah and we can discuss the data as we go. So this is a 45 year old female with a past medical history of anxiety, was referred by primary care physician for persistent fatigue and elevated hematocrit for more than six months now. Um, when she initially presented, her blood count show a white blood cell count of 8.5 hemoglobin of 15.4, hematocrit 49, and a platelets of 560,000. Upon further review, and as I mentioned before, patient had noted to have persistent elevated hematocrit and hemoglobin for more than six months. The EPO level was measured, which came back as four. And given persistently low elevated EPO level, elevated hematocrit, the hematologist recommended bone marrow aspiration and biopsy, which showed a hypercellular marrow with trilineage hematopoiesis. There is myeloid, erythroid, and megakaryocytic hyperplasia, but there was no evidence of dysplasia, and there was no fibrosis noted. There was also myeloid NGS panel that was sent on the bone marrow which came back as positive for jak 2 v 617 f mutation at a variant L frequency of 10%. Along with that, there was also presence of a DNMT3A mutation with a variant L frequency of 6%. So Dr. Gertz, in a case like this, how would you approach whenever you see, get a referral about a patient with polycythemia? Can you please walk us through your thought process and what are the diagnostic tests you would order? Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I think this is a great case for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, uh, whomever did the workup, I really appreciate the fact they checked the erythropoietin level before checking for a JAK2. You know, JAK2 tests, is, are, they're ubiquitous. Anybody can order them all the time. And you find these little JAK2 clones and you don't know what that is. Is it is it arch or is it chip that is with a secondary erythrocytosis or is this truly polycythemia vera? So I think the first and foremost thing in this case, in terms of the workup, check the EPO first. You got a high hemoglobin hematocrit check the EPO first, because you don't want to go checking for CHIP or ARCH without establishing is this primary secondary erythrocytosis. So I really, really appreciate that. Uh, the other thing in the case I think jumps out at me is the fact that the platelets are elevated, right? This is a panmyelosis. So you're going to see elevation in all three cell lines for a lot of, for most patients. 
So it's not just a disease of hemoglobin hematocrit. You're going to see those platelets elevated too, which also sometimes helps you separate out more is this a secondary or primary erythrocytosis before even getting the JAK2 test. Um, the bone marrow biopsy was done, of course. Not every patient needs a bone marrow biopsy. I think if you got a pretty, you know, even the, the diagnostic criteria by the ICC or the, or the WHO will say, well, if you've if you got a high enough hemoglobin and hematocrit, you don't necessarily need it. And a low EPO, you don't need to do the bone marrow. Um, but it's always nice to do the bone marrow for a couple of reasons. One, you establish the baseline amount of fibrosis or scar tissue there. So that in the future, if you want to go back and look, you can compare. Like I always tell patients, you can't draw a line without two dots. The other thing is you get cytogenetics often out of bone marrow. It looks like they weren't maybe done on this particular marrow sample, but you can get cytogenetics, and that may add additional prognostic uh, power to what you're looking at. Um, some analyses will say you know, 20 or even 30% of patients with PV will have an abnormal karyotype. I think you know, that's an, those are old papers, and, and probably today with modern diagnostics and modern recognition of PV, probably that number would be smaller, but still a fair number of patients have you know, additional chromosomal abnormalities that could be uh, of prognostic significance. Now, uh, the other thing in this case I think is really interesting. Uh, it doesn't sound like she's overly symptomatic, uh, some fatigue, but uh, you know, not the classic aquagenic paritis or you know, uh, the night sweats or, or bone pain or anything like that. So that can kind of help sort out therapies in the future as well. But, uh, but a pretty straightforward case. Um, I know that the DMT3 alpha kind of catches people's eye. Uh, you, you know, what is the value of that? Well, it's good to know this there. Um, it, it does suggest that maybe something is uh, amiss in the future for this individual. But, you know, DMT3 alpha, I think, is a little bit controversial. Now, everyone points to it always as a bad thing, especially like an MDS, right? It's always a bad marker. But it seems like in, in MPNs, it's, it's hard to say. There are some analyses that said, yep, it's an adverse marker, some others that do not. In fact, a DMT3 alpha is not part of the MIPS PV scoring system. So the MIPS PV scoring system is a scoring system when you have molecular data available, you can use to determine prognosis in patients with polycythemia vera. So I think that that's uh, something of interest uh, and certainly to follow going forward. Um, but, but really, I think everything was done appropriately in this case. Uh, if I were to critique maybe getting cytogenetics with the marrow, if, if the cells grew and if you were able to get a decent aspirate and all that jazz. But, but the important thing, I, 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 again, I can't stress enough, get the EPO, then the JAK2. It helps make life so much more simple and straightforward when diagnosing, uh, working through the diagnosis of, a, uh, of erythrocytosis. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Gertz. You touched on very, very important points. I think one thing um, I see this often as the workup is being sent in the peripheral blood and they didn't underwent any bone marrow biopsy. And a lot of the times the EPO comes back as normal to elevated. In that instance, you always recommend a bone marrow biopsy or we can get the testing done from the peripheral blood. Yeah, I, I think the, the testing from the peripheral blood is very good. Uh, most JAK2 assays now are very sensitive. Um, they'll pick, you know, even if you don't have a super high white count, a lot of material to work with, um, you, you know, th there'll be enough material there to identify the JAK2 mutation. And again, most patients with polycythemia vera, they won't be in the chip range either. The, 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 those, those variant allele frequencies will be pretty high. In fact, the, the one kind of curious thing about this individual is their hemoglobin I guess their hemoglobin isn't super high. Their hemoglobin is only 15.4. But the, but the variant allele frequency of the JAK2 mutation is a little on the lower end, I would think, for someone with PV. Uh, kind of in that range of, again, chip going into PV, perhaps. I, I think the peripheral blood is, is good enough to make that. Uh, it really, the, the strength of the bone marrow is, like, we, like what you said earlier, you know, checking that baseline fibrosis, getting the cytogenetics, looking for that panmyelosis to ensure that, yes, in fact, this is PV. Yeah. So one of the thing is you and I both in the clinic, we get a lot of referrals about patients with erythrocytosis and you will further work up whether this is you know, JAK2 mutated or JAK2 unmuted erythrocytosis. Is there a particular threshold of hematocrit or hemoglobin you are concerned that he has, this is, could be PV and this is not, this is probably JAK2 mutated PV versus JAK2 unmuted PV, or the threshold of hematocrit doesn't matter. It, it does, you know, it, it, for me, it doesn't matter as much. I mean, if it's elevated, you know, we, we should, you should do the work up the whole way. Um, yeah, definitely the higher it is, the more likely, and, and the more likely you think it is PV, right? Um, 
you know, if it's kind of these subtle things, especially in someone who's older, maybe a smoker, maybe other, you know, sleep apnea, other things going on, you might say, well, you know, this might be a secondary erythrocytosis in the end of the day. But, but you know, I think the, the thrombosis risk and the reduction of, of lifespan and the morbidity that comes with those thrombosis is so grave and so serious that it warrants a workup. You get erythrocytosis, you got to do the workup. Um, and, and you really want to sort that out. Is this PV and, and should we be managing this person's hematic rate? Because again, if it's secondary erythrocytosis, you don't need to phlebotomize them. You don't need to control the hematic rate. And you, you look for the secondary cause. And if you don't find it, you say, well, that's okay. We, we're, we can kind of keep doing what we're doing here. Can I just ask a question, sort of the flip side of that, which is if you have a patient with thrombosis, is there anything other than hematocrit that makes you send a jack too? Because I'm sure you get a lot of the reverse where, where you have all these people who get throm thrombotic thrombophilia screens, which include a jack two. Jack two, yeah. Um, yeah. Is there, is it, obviously the hematocrit would prompt you to think PV, but other than that, are there other things that where you think a jack two should be sent? Yeah, I think, you know, in that kind of basic thrombo th thrombophilia workup, right? So you got someone with a very serious clot or multiple clots and no good explanation, you know, definitely a jack two is warranted there. You know, there are lots of patients who have masked PV, right? So they have iron deficiency or they have like some sort of thalassemia that kind of keeps the hemoglobin down despite actually having a, a, a polycythemia vera under the surface. And, and sometimes we find pretty sizable clones there. You know, I can think of several patients that I have in my clinic who whose hemoglobins have never been very elevated, yet they got sizable JAK2 clones in the thrombosis history. So you would kind of take it as such. Um, the tricky part with the EPO and all that though, right? If your hemoglobin is not elevated, then your EPO is going to be probably in the normal range. Right. Um, and, and, and so it's sometimes tr it's be tricky interpreting the EPO then, but other than that, uh, no, I, I think it's fair to check those Jack two mutations. Again, it's always nice to check the EPO first. Cause it kind of, sh it, it shades your pretest probability, right? When you get that Jack two result. I don't know if you guys remember good old fashioned EBM. We had a, when I was a resident, we had a, a chief of medicine who used to beat this stuff into us. Like what's your pretest probability? What's your post-test probability? And think, think about this. So it's, it's always ingrained in my mind. And right. So if you're just checking a Jack two on someone and you find it and it's a small, a small clone, their counts are sort of elevated. It's, it's tough because you didn't have a very strong pretest probability coming in before you check the Jack two. But if you have that kind of milieu and you check an EPO level and it's low, and then you get a small Jack two clone, then you're okay. This is definitely PV. I think it, it helps you interpret those results. Uh, a little bit better as opposed to saying, well, maybe I should check the EPO and you kind of go back and recheck it again. And because the management of chip is a lot different than the management of polycythemia vera. And so I think, you know, getting kind of down the right diagnostic path is so important. And chip is po is very common, very popular, I guess, very common. Uh, and, and JAK2 V617F is one of the more common mutations. I think it's usually the fourth or fifth or sixth most common mutation uh, chip mutation there is. And so uh, that can be really difficult to sort out sometimes. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, just talking about the symptoms of patients with PV, um, what are the, some of the common symptoms? I think you already mentioned the fatigue is one of them. Aquagenic pruritus is another one. Are there any other symptoms you watch out for patients with PV? Uh, fatigue is a big one, a very common one, whether you're talking ET, PV, or myelofibrosis. And of course, uh, not only is it the most common symptom, it's also the most difficult to treat because in any given individual, fatigue is always multifactorial. You know, is the person, this patient also has anxiety. Do they have like an anxiety depression order that's feeding into their fatigue? Uh, are they not sleeping well at night? Do they have other, you know, are they on a blood pressure medicine? You know, you know the list of things that cause fatigue is all, almost infinite. And when you throw polycythemia vera on top, it's pretty tough to sort out. In fact, a lot of trials that, that look at MPNs in general and measuring symptom burden improvement, throw out fatigue as a measure, right? Because fatigue doesn't always correlate very well with other symptoms that are pretty more clear cut due to the MPN. In polycythemia, vera, more clear cut type of symptoms are this aquagenic pruritus. I mean, it's the, the classic thing that is always on board questions uh, where, you know, you take a nice hot shower, you get out and your, t your skin is intensely itchy, particularly in the trunk area for in the next 15 to 20 minutes. I've had patients who've had it so bad that they, they get excoriations from their fingernails, um, even contemplating, you know, some patients it's like, I can't go on living like this. It's so intense. Um, so for some individuals, it can be pretty, pretty life altering, that aquagenic paritis. 
bone pain is is, pre is present in some patients, but a little less is less common than say in myelofibrosis. Uh, night sweats are certainly common, uh, more common in polycythemia veris compared to say ET, e uh, almost on par with, with myelofibrosis. So that's a very common symptom. Roughly a third of patients with PV will present with an enlarged spleen. Now, you know, the spleens aren't these things, you know, that are so big. It's not like John Hurt in the movie Aliens, where like the spleen is coming out of their belly. But, it, you know, for some patients, it can be pretty significant, even if it's not that large. And, and so, so we will see some early satiety and abdominal discomfort in these patients as well. But that's really kind of the things that you're thinking about. It is virtually the same list that we use for myelofibrosis and for ET. Um, but with that kind of special emphasis on the whole aquagenic paritis, because it's just so unique and, and uh, kind of, you know, pings your ears uh, for either board questions or for, for polycythemia vera. So, uh, yeah, next we'll come to risk stratification. So, uh, Dr. Gers, before we recommend therapy, we need to risk stratify our patients. So what are the prognostic factors that you use in clinic to risk stratify patients with PV? Yeah. And so there's a lot of different ways to look at, at risk stratification. And and with PV and ET, I would say that there's kind of two main things you do, right? So there there aren't a lot of therapies that can modify the disease course, course without equivocation. I'm not going to get in the whole debate about interferons right now or anything else. But you know, it's, in the large part, it's felt that you know no, none of the, the treatments for polycythemia vera outside, say, an allogeneic transplant are curative, right? And so we focus on the complications of the disease very directly, but we still want to understand the overall survival and overall prognosis for these patients. Really, the best model that we have is this MIPS-PV score, which incorporates things that are you know, very well known, like thrombosis history and blood counts, as well as, as molecular information as well. Are there, is there a high-risk molecular type there? So getting that NGS in our, in our case earlier was really important and helps risk stratify these folks. But that's the model I usually reach for. Uh, in clinic when I'm trying to discuss with a patient what their prognosis may be with polycythemia vera. There are older models that are purely clinical that you could use uh, that just take into account for age and, and other risk factors for, for survival. Um, but you know, if the molecular data is available, I, I do prefer the MIPS-PV score. But we often talk about thrombosis risk because that's what drives our management for these patients. Because uh, you know, the average, you know, average survival for a patient with PV these days is well beyond 25 years. So it's, it's hard to recommend transplant, right? So if you ever look at the curative therapy, bone marrow transplant or allogeneic stem cell transplant, when the survival for any given disease is predicted to be five years or less, then transplant has an advantage. But if the survival is greater than 10 years, then transplant does, or five years, then transplant does not have an advantage. And so PV, by its nature uh, of how good we've managed it these days, you know, transplant's not indicated for those patients. So Really, we focus on the complications being thrombotic risk, and unfortunately, or fortunately, or however you want to look at it, we have a very simple model, age and thrombosis history. So if you're young and never had a blood clot, you're considered low risk. Everybody else is high risk. I like it because it's easy to remember. <laughs> I don't have to think too hard. But honestly, it falls short, right? It seems so antiquated. We have such cool things like AI, you know, chat GPT, we have molecular data. I mean, we have electric cars that are going up and down roads, you know, uh, it, all this amazing technology, yet for risk stratification in PV, we're still using age and thrombosis history. It's kind of sad, right? So, so definitely lots of groups are looking at things to try to improve on our ability to progno prognosticate for blood clots, whether we're looking at other blood counts, molecular markers, uh, cytokine levels, what have you. You know, there's no consensus yet in how to move forward. Things are slowly moving. I think we'll talk about that over the course of the podcast here. But uh, but we definitely need to do better. But this is the standard care as of today. Um, and, and so, and that helps parse out what we're going to do for our patients. You know, sometimes if the patients ask them, what is the risk of progression to MDS AML during the course of their lifetime in somebody who's newly diagnosed with PV, uh, what number do you typically quote them? Oh boy, that's a tough question because every case is so different, right? And then, then, then you get like the chromosomes and you get the the mutation analysis, and that'll influence the the kind of milieu in your mind. I, you know, I keep it. I try to for an individual patient keep it pretty simple and somewhat somewhat vague because <laughs> you can read a lot of different studies and get a lot of different answers, right? So, you know, in, in terms of lifetime risk of progression to myelofibrosis, I'll tell patients, you know, it ranges anywhere from fifteen to twenty five percent. And the lifetime risk of progression to AML is somewhere less than 10%. So, you know, that's, um, I think, kind of a, 
easy, easy numbers to remember for the patient and for myself. Uh, I explain that as a starting point. So this is kind of the general for everybody. Then we look at your case. Well, you also have you know, this P53 mutation, and then there's this other mutation, and, and this doesn't look good, and I'm worried that this could progress sooner rather than later. Or, you know, I'll get a patient who's otherwise healthy and say they're they're older and, and they don't have any adverse risk mutations, and it'd be like, well, you know, in all likelihood, this will be PV for the rest of your life and will not shorten your expected lifespan. So I, I, I think I, I, I tend to give these kind of ranges based on what data has been published, and then really try to take that as a starting point and, and refine that for any individual patient. Yeah, we're hoping to chat about the REVEAL study next, which looked at yeah. thrombotic events in both high-risk and low-risk PV patients. Of course, it's the largest prospective study in PV uh, led by yourself um, uh, with more than 2,500 patients. So could you tell us a bit about the study findings and, and why you think it's clinically relevant? So the, yeah, as you mentioned, first and foremost, it's just a big study. It's a big wad of data uh, to over 2,500 patients with a median follow-up of over three and a half years. So just a big pile of data. And, and in this reveal, this observational, prospective observational study, there's also samples sitting there um, waiting for analysis. And this is just kind of one of our first passes, to be honest. And, and simple questions. We're starting with very simple questions. Like, what are, are, are there other simple blood counts that predict for blood clot risk? And that was our first question. And, you know, just because it, it's just so antiquated, our thought that, well, gee, you're under the age of 60 and you've never had a blood clot, so you're obviously low risk. But we know those patients can have clots too. And, and is there something else that might modify the way we treat these folks that, that could, uh, could minimize that risk of clots? And so we looked at white blood cell count and platelets primarily. And there have been lots of other papers published, you know, retrospective data analyses that show that white count elevation leukocytosis is associated with clot risk. What that cutoff is, is unclear. There are some papers that'll be up as high as 20. Others will say, you know, you know, anything greater than eight or nine. So it's tough to say there's, there's a big range there based on the, the data that's already been published. So we kind of looked at what we started with the, the normal range, right? So most labs go up to 10 or 11 or 12 as their cutoff. So we started at 11. We looked at cutoffs at 11, 12, and so on and so forth. And there are two things that kind of jump out with this analysis. The first thing is there was a dose response curve. As the white count went up, the clot risk went up. Whenever you test a drug, that's something we want to know, right? As we increase the dose of the drug, do we see more and more responses? It tells you that the drug is actually doing something, that it's just not finding things by random chance. So there is a dose response curve for leukocytosis and clot risk in PV. And for us in, in our analysis with this big, powerful database, it wasn't a very high cutoff. It was 11 that we start really start to see these risks go up. When you adjust for hematocrit, right? So say you get your hematocrit under 45%, does that still hold true? In fact, it did. The threshold was a little higher, it was more, it was 12, but still not a very big number. And think of a lot of patients that I've seen with PV who have white counts of 13, 14, or 15 even. And those patients probably by this analysis are at a higher risk for blood clot. What this study does not answer is the ultimate question. It doesn't bring a full circle. It doesn't say that if you bring that white count down, then you're modifying that risk, right? So this only really can put associations together since it's an observational study, but it can't ask, a answer that interventional question necessarily. Uh, yeah, certainly if you take the logic that patients with hematocrits under 45, then still have elevated white count, still have risk, then you could postulate that that, that is the case. And it, it may lower your, one's threshold to starting cytoreductive therapy in a lower risk patient if their white count's high. Certainly it, it has, this and other data has modified my everyday practice. Uh, I've, for some time now, I've had a kind of a rule of thumb. If a, pa white, a patient's white count's over 15, I have serious conversations with that patient about cytoreduction to bring down their, not only their hematocrit, but their white count uh, in, in low risk situations, just because the, there is a preponderance of data. The 12 to 15 range is a little bit of a more question mark. I think, you know, obviously that's what Reveal tells us, but again, it's, it's not fully closing that loop. But I think there's enough retrospective and prospective studies now that all say the same thing. And I think really establishes white count as a risk factor, even when hematocrit is controlled for thrombosis. On the flip side, platelets. Platelets, oh, platelets. Platelets are a pain uh, in, 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 in MPNs, right? You can read 
all, you know, it, using ET as the example, you can read all 180 whatever pages of the NCCN guidelines. You will not find a single platelet count goal for all of ET, right? And yet I get all these patients referred to me saying, well, gee, this person with ET, their platelets, I can only get them down to 482. That's the lowest I can get them. And I got them on 16 grams of hydria a day. I'm like, please stop. You know, like, I don't want to say platelets don't matter because I'm going to offend a whole lot of platelet biologists out there and a whole lot of people, but platelets do not reliably predict thrombosis in PV or ET for that matter. The first and foremost point is there is no dose response curve. As the platelet counts go up, the risk does not go up. In fact, in the reveal analysis, we did see a little bit of a bump when we were just doing univariate analysis and we were just looking at platelet counts. When you use a cutoff of 400, we did see an association of risk of clots with platelet counts greater than 400. But when you go up to a higher threshold, the 600, that, that association disappears. And it wasn't because of small numbers. There were still quite a few patients with platelet counts over 600, but the association goes away. So there's no dose response curve. Secondly, when you start to adjust for hematocrit control, and then you try to factor in your mind too, a lot of these patients are getting phlebotomies, which are going to cause platelet elevations for other reasons. So not because of pan-mylosis, but just because of iron fish deficiency driving these things. So at the end of the day, we couldn't convincingly prove that platelet elevations are associated with clot risk. So I think that's important too, right? You got a patient with PV and you're doing phlebotomies and their crit's great. It's 43.8%. They feel fantastic. Their platelet counts 600. That's okay. You got someone on hydroxyurea, their hematocrit's 42.4. They feel great. But their platelets are, you know, 580, 600, 700. It's okay. Platelets, I'm not going to say platelets don't matter, but platelets don't influence treatment selection necessarily in polycythemia there. And could you could you also comment a bit about the JAK2 findings in terms of the JAK2 variant allele frequencies and also in terms of what what happens if you can get the JAK2 allele burden down? Yeah, so if we really get into the weeds of the reveal study, that it was done at a lot of centers, not just academic centers, but everyday practices all across the country. And one of the challenges was there wasn't uniform diagnosis. There was, I mean, everybody tried to stick to the WHO, um, but there were lots of missing JAK2 uh, analyses, um, JAK2 you know, tests, and the the number of patients who were proven JAK2 positive on the reveal study was a little bit lower than what you would expect compared to historical data. So with that caveat in mind, I'll poke a hole my, a hole in my own data here, I guess. Um, you know, we we did we began to look at variant allele frequencies and try to try to match it. So as you might expect, as the allele burden gets higher, counts go up. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, more you're, the more the marrow is becoming this clonal. Uh, this clonal onslaught, this clonal tsunami of of proliferation. So you can see the white counts go up. You see, of course, hematocrits and hemoglobins and, and even platelets go up. And there was this hint that JAK2 allele burden reduction over time could uh, be, it was associated with decreased risk of um, thrombotic events and maybe even disease progression. Um, I'm going to say that very softly because I think that's more hypothesis generating than proving, but, but we saw that, you know, Clearly, the thrombosis risk, I think, is a little bit more uh, uh, convincing there. And if you partner this with the MAGIC PV trial, you hear it again, right? So the MAGIC PV trial was a prospective randomized phase two trial looking at ruxolitinib versus hydroxyurea in patients who have already had hydroxyurea. So not a really fair comparison, right? Um, it's like you pick out the slowest guy at school and run, against, run a race against them knowing that you're going to beat them. Not a fair comparison. But what we learned in that trial for the first time in a prospective randomized matter is that when the JAK2 allele burdens do go down, thrombosis risk goes down and thrombosis free survival goes up and overall survival went up too in that trial. So it's really nice to see that this observational cohort and what we observed there matched this trial data in terms of direction of effect for the JAK2 allele burden. And of course, this matches, you know, the most Famous, I would say, uh, data out of Cornell showing that, you know, patients treated with interferons over long periods of time versus hydroxyurea will have a better, you know, progression-free survival there as well. So it's all starting to fit together that, and it makes sense, right? If we can modify disease, we're going to modify disease, right? If we can reduce the amount of bad clones there, 
we should improve things like thrombosis risk and survival and and and, and progression free survival and all these types of things. And I think it's just one more piece of data on that pile. And and what this does at the end of the day drives us to develop better therapies for PV, right? So here's this data saying, yes, if we can drive JAK2 allele burdens down, we can reduce thrombosis risk, maybe improve the risk of progression. And, and that should drive us to develop new therapies that are better than what we have today. Those are excellent points, Dr. Gertz. I think, so based on the Reveal study as well as the Magic PV study you talked about, are you in your practice routinely checking JAK2 variant level <laughs> frequency while the patients are on treatments? That's a great question. Um, and I'll, I'll have to switch caps here and maybe put my NCCN cap on. For those who have followed the NCCN guidelines very, very closely, I know all of you read it like every day, um, front, front to back. When you wake up in the morning, you have your bowl of cereal, you drink your coffee and you read the NCCN guidelines, right? Uh, um, so historically the guidelines have been don't check the don't 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 repeat allele burden checks just don't do it it's it's it, there's no clinical there's no action clinical actionable type of thing to do with this right it's data but what are we doing here and then on top of it, insurances weren't paid for it you may have noticed with the recent addition of the ncn guidelines it's softened it's like if you want to go ahead and check it so it's it's kind of what it's saying um because there are you know again we see the reveal data, we see magic PV, we see the Cornell data, we see this data kind of coming out saying that, gee, if the allele burden's going down, that could be a good thing. And then two, we think about the discontinuation studies that are ongoing. So in France, there's a trial uh, with interferons uh, and that if, and there's, a, there's gonna be one here in the United States launching very soon. Uh, and the premise is if someone is in a hematologic remission for two years and has a variant allele frequency less than 10%, you can interrupt therapy, right? So getting back to the question of, do you repeat allele burden? Well, if you have something to do with that information, then it makes sense to check it, right? So if you have a patient who's been on interferons and you're like, maybe we can get away with a treatment interruption for a while, then you would say, okay, let's repeat this JAK2 allele burden. And if it's going down, or even if they're in a molecular emission, this would kind of give us more, you know, a higher level of comfort in discontinuing therapy for some time. So to me, I think there's increasing utility of rechecking. So I have begun doing that for patients, particularly patients who are uh, on interferons where we are entertaining the idea of discontinuation. So I think moving more towards management of PV, I know you already touched on a few important points, but what is the goal of therapy with for PV patients? What are we trying to, are we trying to prolong their life or are we trying to reduce the risk of thrombosis? Or are we trying to prevent the progression to AML or myelofibrosis? What is our yes. goal here? Yes, all of the above, right? Okay. All of the above, right? Um, you know, we definitely want to reduce, reduce risks, whether we're talking about progression, clot risk, what have you. You know, obviously clot risk is always central and focused because it's the most common thing that happens um, and, and happens with, with such regularity in these patients. You know, patients who don't really get their hematocrits under control generally have clots within three years of diagnosis. So Getting, getting counts under control is so important for that for that reason. But we also don't want to make things worse. We don't want to increase the risk of progression. We think about old drugs like busulfan and, and uh, you know, other things that have been used that can accelerate that risk of progression to AML. We want to try to avoid those things if we can. And if there are therapies out there that can reduce the risk going forward uh, of progression, we want to use those potentially. But you know, kind of the framework that I have in my mind is that there are two truths to treating polycythemia vera, right? Or it's kind of like a snowflake, right? You have to have like a little piece of dirt, a nucleus, right? To start your snowflake. And so the nucleus of polycythemia vera treatment is gonna be keep the hematocrit under 45% and low dose aspirin. So those are the two things I think most people, almost everybody will agree upon are important. Keeping the hematocrit under 45 comes from the CytoPV trial, a prospective randomized trial, uh, randomizing patients between tight control and loose control of their hematocrit, it showed that keeping the hematocrit under 45% dramatically reduced the risk of thrombosis and thrombosis-associated death, even though that trial only enrolled half the patients it planned to. It only reached half its power, and it still showed that, which I think is pretty remarkable. The other thing is, is the low-dose aspirin. So that comes from the ECLAPS study, 
I think you can start to poke holes in ECLAP. So ECLAP was done in an era before we had tight hematic control. So we don't have the answer to the question, well, if we keep the hematic rate under 45%, do we really need aspirin? But at the end of the day, aspirin is, I think, a pretty low bar to jump over, right? It doesn't, it's it's cheap, it's widely available, it doesn't cause a lot of side effects. You know, people do pretty well with aspirin in general. Um, so so the, that's kind of where we start from, right? And I, honestly, I think everything beyond that, you could debate one way or the other. You can cite whatever paper, you can cite whatever expert or, or wonk you want to and kind of plug the things in. But I think as long as you keep those things at your core, uh, you, you'll do right by patients. And so keeping the hematocrit under 45%, we generally use the, the, the classic thrombohemorrhagic model or whatever you want to call it, where if patients are under the age of 60 and they've never had a blood clot, we use phlebotomy primarily to control their counts, at least as a starting off point. And those who are either over the age of 60 or have a history of blood clot, we use a cytoreductive therapy, whether it's hydroxyurea, interferons, ruxolitinib, what have you, uh, some medicine to lower their counts. Um, and that's that's been the kind of the plan or the algorithm for many years, ever since the polycythemia vera study group in the 70s really started working with hydroxyurea in the low-risk and high-risk populations. One other question is, how do you choose between hydroxyurea and ropic interferon? We have two options for either high-risk PV as well as low-risk PV. Um, once they are intolerant or not responding to phlebotomy, you want to switch to a hydroxyurea or, or ropic interferon. How do you choose? So, yeah, I think that's a tough question. And unfortunately, here in the United States, a lot of that is driven by insurance and what insurance will cover. Ropeg interferon's label is very generous. It's line agnostic. It's risk agnostic. It's like if you have PV, you can use this drug, which I think is excellent. It's, it's supposed to give us some freedom in trying to determine the best therapy for individual patients. Um, but it's expensive, right? You know, the wholesale acquisition price is what, like 10 grand a shot, which is not cheap. And you think about hydroxyurea, I think I think a box of Tic Tacs is more expensive than a, you know, a bottle of hydroxyurea. And so it, it, it's definitely tough. And you want to develop, you don't know, want to you know, deliver the best care possible, but the, but the highest value care too. So I, I get it. Um, but, but I think there are advantages to both. And, you know, Honestly, it's a case by case basis. I, I think hydroxyurea and interferons are, are choice one and one A when when thinking about in, cytoreduction in patients with with polycythemia vera. And I will go so far to say is an essential thrombocythemia too. So I'll sit down with a patient and say, okay, we've decided to do cytoreductive therapy, and we got a couple of choices here. And I'll say here, here's one one option is hydroxyurea. It's a pill. It's easy to take. It's cheap. Insurance won't fight us. You know, here are the pluses, here is the side of, here are the minuses and the side effects. Here are here's ropeg interferon. Here are the pluses and the minuses of ropeg interferon. And I try to have a shared decision making uh, approach with every patient when choosing first or even second line uh, uh, cytoreductive therapy. So I really you know heavily uh, away on what a patient wants to do with their treatment. A lot of patients have gone; they're very tech savvy. They go online, they read all these papers, and say, "Well, you know, I'm really excited about the you know, interferons, and I really want to give that a try." And we 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 try to get those for them through their insurance and everything, and use those. Other patients are like, "You know what? I hate needles. I never want to see a needle again in my life. I would rather take a pill." And 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 so so patients, I think, can help help guide that decision. I can't say one is better than the other, right? Um, every study that's been done comparing interferons with hydroxyurea for their primary endpoints say that they're equivalent, and the primary endpoint often being count control. Of course, there are some potential benefits to interferons that go beyond hydroxyurea. We often talk again about the variant allele frequency reduction. You know, in the in the PROW PV trial slash continuation study, roughly 10% of patients had a molecular remission, meaning we could no longer detect the JAK2 mutation, which I think is very powerful information. And of course, the retrospective data out of Cornell, as I mentioned before, showing that patients treated with interferons or have a better myelofibrosis-free survival than those treated with hydroxyurea. And then the data from Reveal and Magic PV showing that if allele burdens do go down, that's a good thing over time. So I think there's a lot of arguments for using interferons. Um, but there's never been a study that says that interferons are definitively better than hydroxyurea. So I think it's hard to make the argument uh, because so many patients do very well on hydroxyurea for a very long time. Um, when do you start thinking about switching to ruxolitinib? I know we already talked about magic PV study, but there's yeah. also a response clinical trial. Maybe you can talk about both the data and when, when in your practice you will 
start thinking about switching to Jacofi? Yeah, so both re uh, response and response two uh, focused on patients who had previously had hydroxyurea and were intolerant, had bad, you know, bad side effects, or the hydroxyurea didn't do a good job for them keeping their counts under control based on the ELN criteria meaning, you know, two grams a day and still not getting the counts under control or running into cytopenias is another problem, uh, despite not getting the hematocrit under control. So it's a very specific population, and especially for reveal, because those patients also had to have splenomegaly. So if you just take that alone, that already cuts your population of PV patients down to one third of the total population. Um, so these are very specific groups of patients. Um, and so definitely where those trials were done, it makes sense to use uh, ruxolitinib in those cases. But boy, the, the magic PV data really did shift my mind a little bit more. And I would say I have a lower threshold for changing these days now that that data is out there. Uh, also, we have a wealth of experience with ruxolitinib now. It's been approved since 2011 for myelofibrosis. And, and so with that experience and the PV experience and some ET experience, I think we have a lot of real world experience with the drug, you know, decades worth now, uh, including the trial experience. So I'm pretty comfortable with Roxalitinib. And if patients have splenomegaly or symptoms that are not controlled by controlling the hematocrit, I have a pretty low threshold for switching over to Roxalitinib. You know, kind of the classic case would be, hey, you know, you got someone who has really bad, you know, aquagenic pruritus to use an example, and we put them on hydroxyurea, we get their crit under 45, but they're still itching, they're itching like crazy and it's miserable. I think that's a very acceptable place to switch to hydroxyurea uh, or switch to Ruxolin from hydroxyurea, even though it doesn't meet the, the inclusion criteria necessarily for the reveal studies. So, so symptomatic control of spleen or cytokine mediated symptoms, I think it makes complete sense as well. So we know Ruxolin is so much better than hydroxyurea doing those types of things. And then you add in the magic PV data saying that, gee, if we can get this allele burden down, we can, re we can improve patient survival. I, I think that that's, that really kind of moves the, moves the needle for me personally. Um, but I, I have a relatively low threshold for switching people over. Got it. Um, just for our listeners, Dr. Gertz, do you mind briefly say, you know, stating what the design of magic PV study was? Like what was the study design? Yeah, magic PV in essence was a prospective randomized phase two trial. Uh, where patients were previously exposed to hydroxyurea and, uh, and similar to the reveal studies, didn't do optimally well on hydroxyurea, and then were randomized between ruxolitinib and best available therapy. Now, most patients in the best available therapy arm did receive hydroxyurea. <laughs> so again, it wasn't necessarily a fair comparison, but nonetheless, uh, it was a, that was the design of the study. And, and the whole idea was to try to it wasn't as stringent as the reveal studies. And so the idea was to kind of expand on, on maybe some of the places we could reasonably use ruxolitinib. Uh, and, and also being a more modern study, you know, done later than the reveal studies, there was more emphasis on measuring that allele burden and seeing what it does over time. Is there any instances where you would combine any of these agents, like combine interferon and ruxolitinib to have an optimal control of both i know there is no data supporting that and this is right now clinical trial ongoing but in your practice do you ever yeah. do it i typically do not i'm a big fan of doing one thing at one time for for one disease uh, just because you're adjusting stuff so say you have them both on rux and on on Ro, on, on ropeg or, or even you know regular interferon and you know all of a sudden the liver enzymes go up well, was it the rocks? Was it interferon? Was it something completely different? It makes it really hard to sort out a lot of these things and adjusting the doses too, right? Yes, the clinical trials are ongoing. I, I think some of the preliminary data suggests that the toxicity is going to be greater in combination. Mm -hmm. um, some of the data suggests though that you can control symptoms and allele burden at the same time by combining the two. I think that's really interesting. But as of today, I, I typically don't combine them um, barring that those results coming out um, for the combination studies. Same with hydroxyurea and ruxolitinib. I try not to use the combination. Sometimes you just have to say, you know, you got good hematocrit control and good symptom control, but the white count's still super high and you got to add on some hydroxyurea sometimes. Um, but, but no, I really try to do, do one therapy at a time. That same goes for phlebotomy. I see so many patients who are on like 500 hydroxyurea, but they're still getting phlebotomies every, every other month. And then like, that's really two therapies, right? 
And then, yeah. and then you get other things creeping in. You get symptoms and side effects from iron deficiency. And then, well, gee, where's all this fatigue coming from? Is it coming from the rocks? Is it coming from the hydrea? Is it coming from the PV? Is it coming from the iron deficiency? There's just so much going on. It's super hard to sort out. So I, I really am a big fan of, of, of focusing on one therapy, trying to maximize that, and then switching to another singular therapy as opposed to, to multiple therapies. Sometimes you got to do it uh, to get things under control, but I, I really... I'm not a very smart or complicated person. I, I got to keep it simple for my own sanity, and so I really like to uh, I really like to focus in on that. Yeah, one other practical question uh, this might you know I've encountered personally in the clinic is that not for not for every patient, forty five percent of control of hematocrit controls their symptom burden. We see it all the time, and I've seen different practitioners reducing the threshold to 43, 42, arbitrarily saying that, oh, that could control their symptoms. How, how do you, you know, kind of manage these challenging situations? Do you change the threshold of hematocrit? Do you lower it to see that that might benefit their symptom burden? Yeah, th there are those in the field who do advocate for a lower threshold for, for women, for example, um, you know, based on some older blood flow data and, and just the just based on the fact that Women, on average, have a slightly lower hematocrit than men. Um, but that's all that's based on. There's no prospective data saying that 42 is a better threshold for women uh, compared to 45. So the cytopv PV trial, if we kind of go back to our nucleus of care for PV, the cytopv trial, everybody was at 45. There was no differences for any given individual. So all I can say for thrombosis risk, the best data we have is 45. I do have a handful of patients who do feel better with lower thresholds, and I will use those lower thresholds for those individuals. I have a patient who has like a regional pain syndrome, and if we keep the hematocrit closer to 41, 42, the regional pain syndrome is better than if we keep the threshold at 45. I have other patients who have migraines or headaches or other symptoms that, yeah, like they come in and say, doc, you know, if we keep my threshold at 42, I feel so much better than at 45. I'm like, great. That's, that's perfectly fine. We can do that. Um, but I, I don't keep a lower th uh, hematocrit threshold for thrombosis risk reduction. But if if there are symptoms that are better on a lower threshold, I, well, we do do that. Um, we're talking about the next agent, is, which is recently published in New England Journal of Medicine, is rusferitide, which is an injectable peptide mimetic of the hepcidin. Can you maybe talk more about the data as well as what is uh, rusferitide and do you see that it could have the potential to change how we approach or how we treat PV patients? Yeah. I don't know how, like, again, I, I'm a hammer and everything's a nail. And, and I mean, I think MPNs are just the coolest thing ever, but, uh, and I know that makes me somewhat unique, but how awesome are our MPNs right now? We are tackling hepcidin from both directions, right? So, and, and for a long time, hepcidin is like, you know, catnip for hematologists, right? Iron, iron shuttling, and you know, like the, the classical hematologists love this, love hepcidin, right? And I, I remember it from med school, I remember it from fellowship, didn't really think much about it until more recently in the MPN world. But, but we're lowering hepcidin levels in myelofibrosis to improve anemia, and we're effectively raising hepcidin activity in PV to treat erythrocytosis. How awesome is that? It's like a, <laughs> it's a beautiful story, right? As an yeah. editor, I love this stuff, right? You can't, you can't even make it up, right? But in PV, we are effectively increasing hepcidin or increasing hepcidin levels or, or, or hepcidin activity, if you will, to plug up the pores that let iron out of the iron stores to make it available for erythropoiesis. Erythro, uh, so basically, we're tricking the bone marrow into thinking it's iron deficient when it actually isn't. And rusfertide is is the first compound kind of out doing that. It's in a phase three trial. We just published, as you mentioned, the phase two trial. And it was incredibly effective. The, the, the thing for me that is the, the take home point from that whole study is the swimmer's plot of all the patients. So uh, as, the, as, the, as the plot goes from left to right, you see all these triangles, meaning phlebotomies, and they start on drug, the triangles go away. And then they go through the blinded withdrawal or, or the, there was a very brief clinical hold on the trial, and so they, all the patients had to come off, and all the triangles come back. And then they go back on rusfertide in the extension part of the trial, and all the triangles go away again. I mean, amazing, right? Just eliminated the triangles, eliminated the phlebotomies. Uh, and you could see measures of iron stores all go up, right? So, uh, you know, the ferritin's improved, 
Uh, we were able to measure hepcidin somewhat. It's very tricky to measure in in in, in real life, uh, in clin in in real life clinical systems. But you know, we all see you know, all these measures of iron get better in patients, and that tracked with symptom improvement, right? So we eliminated the burden of phlebotomies. You got to get up. You got to drive to the cancer center. You got to sit in a chair. You got to get a needle in your arm. You got to do all this annoying stuff, right? We eliminated that need. We let people's iron replete, and it repleted quite quickly. And then lastly, their symptoms from that iron deficiency, what we presume are from the iron deficiency, got better. So to me, that is a win-win-win for these folks. I think bigger questions of will this demodify disease in a meaningful way? Can it reduce risk of progression? Can it reduce risk of you know, thrombosis? You know, that remains to be seen. And then lastly, if you think about the next steps, right? So the ongoing registration trial, the phase three registration studies, accruing patients, if this drug does get you know, approved and get to market, how are the, what do the costs look like? What is the value of that care? Is this drug going to be so expensive that it's actually cheaper to, to, to have a, a nurse stick a needle in your arm in an infusion room with all the associate fees with that? Or is it, is, is it going to be cheaper to get a shot? I'm not entirely sure about that. I think that's going to be really interesting, the economics of the whole drug as it moves forward. But clearly, it's proof of concept. If we mess with hepcidin, uh, we can mess with disease, right? And, and again, on the flip side, with myelofibrosis, we're doing the same thing. Proof of concept. If we lower hepcidin levels, we can we can fire up erythrocytosis. If we can raise hepcidin levels, we can we can dampen uh, erythrocytosis. So it's it's just overall just a real cool story. Is there any particular side effect profile are you worried about in patients with resveratide? Given this is a phase two study, a yeah. limited of seventy patients and a dose finding study as well. So uh, is there any side effect profile you are particularly concerned about? Yeah, the two big ones are injection site reactions. So patients definitely have a lot of itchiness at the injection site, uh, at least in the phase two trial. Now the formulation did change slightly for the phase three. They went from like on a pre-filled syringe to like on a lipophilic thing where you have to mix it up as a patient before you inject it. So that may improve in the phase three, I'm not sure. But the injection site reactions were, were, were the real deal. Um, so itchiness, a lot of patients would get these red welts that would last for about a month or so at the injection site. Um, I, in fact, I had one patient come off trial because the, the, the injection site reactions were so bad. The other thing, uh, platelet count elevations. So presumably the same mechanism that drives thrombocytosis um, in iron deficiency, driving thrombocytosis in, these, in some of these patients. Again, we, as I mentioned earlier, platelet counts are less uh, important in our treatment decisions, we'll say. I'm not going to say the platelets aren't important. They are important, but but you know that really shouldn't change the treatment approach there. But we did see a fair number of patients have thrombocytosis more than what we'd expect uh, uh, on this medication. A lot of interesting agents are coming down the pipeline, but I think one important point is what are the, some of the important endpoints in these clinical trials, especially in the upfront setting. Now we talked about Jack to a little bit reduction. Do you think that these endpoints should be included in the clinical trials as a primary and, and secondary endpoints. I think we have enough data now suggesting that reduction allele burden does correlate with positive outcomes that we can begin to, to more firmly use this as a surrogate in trials going forward. Just controlling counts is going to be is not going to be good enough for new drugs. You know, we already have interferons, we have ruxolitib, we have hydroxyurea, maybe rusfertide someday. I think just controlling hematocrit is going to be not enough. And we're going to have to do more to get drugs approved. We're already seeing this in myelofibrosis, right? So we had two upfront studies that were positive in their primary endpoint. They improved spleen volume reductions. Yeah, everyone's like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know about these drugs. Because just spleen volume reduction and symptom burden control in myelofibrosis may not be enough anymore. And I think likewise in PV, just hematocrit control is not going to be enough. So we're going to have to show variant allele reduction. We're going to have to show some biomarker of long-term outcome. The actual outcomes themselves is going to be really difficult, right? Median time to progression to myelofibrosis is 15 years. That that trial would outlast my career, uh, which is fine if we if someone wants to pay for that. But um, I, I think that'd be an unreasonably expensive trial, and, and you know, and certainly you know, like survival. Uh, boy, you'd have to pick a really high-risk population that may not be representative of everyone in order to show a survival advantage. So I think that's going to be really, really tough. So we we, we got to rely on these biomarkers, the best that we have, which 
I think the best we have right now is allele burden reduction. So I, I will go out on a limb and say, I think these things need to be key secondary endpoints now going forward. Uh, there are other drugs, as you mentioned, being developed like Gavinistat. Gavinistat can shrink clones as well, particularly high-risk clones. And so I think that'll be something of interest out of that trial, the Gavin trial. Uh, as well as other agents in, in the phase one and phase two settings. You already mentioned a little bit about transplant, but do you ever refer any PV patient who are medically fit, you know, for allogeneic transplant, maybe like something for the future or somebody who you, who you think is high risk? How do you approach that? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, so uh, as a fellow, uh, you know, I was at a place that had a very rich institutional database for transplant and a very historic one as well. And there wasn't, I think there was like one patient with PV in the whole shebang for multiple decades. Uh, you know, and, and I, I couldn't tell you what the C, if there's anything in the CIBMTR, but um, it's pretty rare. Uh, that there, there are patients we've discussed, mainly these patients who just have keep having thrombosis and, 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 you know, we get their hematica control, we get them on different drugs, and we just can't stop the blood clots. And we talk about, well, is transplant an option, right? because that's the only way to truly eliminate this clone if we think that that's what's driving it. Usually these patients have a lot of liver clot burden and that precludes transplant. So it's it's kind of like, well, this might be the one thing that could fix things, but also on the flip side, your liver stinks. And if we transplant you, you we might kill your liver too. And so it's it's a really tough situation. Um, I, I don't think the data is such where even a high-risk patient for progression to AML or myelofibrosis would warrant transplant. Uh, as of today, you know, even if I got a PV patient with like you know, P53, ASXL1, and, uh, and DMT3 alpha all packaged up nicely in their in their PV cells, I still don't think I would transplant that patient right now unless there was some sign of progression or clonal evolution uh, uh, prior to me to do so. So I can't really think of a situation where um, I would actively be pursuing transplant out of those rare, other than those rare circumstances. Thank you so much, Dr. Gertz, for that excellent discussion, and thank you for your time. We look forward to having you again on our podcast in the future. Well, thank you so much for uh, including me.